Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our first uh, section sponsored webinar for the year. And we're really excited to start this webinar off with John Chambers. This is great to have him here. And in fact, he used to be a chair way back when, chair of our section. So um, I'd like to give a brief introduction about him. Um, he, John was a member of Bell Labs research from 96 until his retirement in 2005. His research has touched nearly all aspects of computing with data, but he's best known for the S language and his successor R. The Association for Computing Machinery presented him its Software System Award for the design of the S system. And this is the only time the award has been made for statistical software. Since 2008, he's been active at Stanford where he's currently adjunct professor in the Department of Statistics and senior advisor to Stanford Data Science, being particularly involved with the Data Science Scholars Program for selected graduate students across all fields involved with data science. He is the author or co-author of nine books and his most recent book is Extending R, published in 2016. For today's audience, he's been a member of ASA for over 50 years. And, and as I mentioned, actually he was the first elected chair of the statistical computing section. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to John Chambers. Welcome, John, thank you. Thanks, Asia, and uh, welcome everybody. So I'm really pleased to, to be with you all. Let me uh, share my screen so you can see the slides. So I hope you're now all seeing a nice big slide. So uh, let me start off by a little bit of general discussion. I'm going to give a, a, a version, a somewhat similar talk to the History of Programming Languages conference, which is going to take place in a few weeks. And for that audience, I'm going to start by introducing R and give people a, a general notion of what it is for those who've never heard of it before. But I'm going to take a chance and, and assume that for a seminar sponsored by the computing section of the ASA, I will assume that the audience actually has heard of R already. Uh, but let's take a look at, um, at a view of things from outside our profession, or outside the statistics profession at least. And, whoops, we will, if I can get this to work right, yes. So <clears throat> here's a paper that appeared in a recent issue of the journal Science. It's one of Science's uh, perspective articles. Perspective articles typically in, in science take a look at a field or uh, some other papers that have been published in the field and reflect on what the implications are of a broader nature. In this case, Lawrence Whitmer, who's a paleontologist, is reflecting on two other papers which appeared in the same issue of science. Uh, these, these papers used some fa fascinating data uh, based on uh, micro -computer, computerized tomography to extract models and do data analysis on the inner ears of fossils of dinosaurs and birds, which is quite exciting. And they, the, the analysis itself was basically all done in R. So the author of the, of the perspective had a number of uh, observations that, that were made, which uh, I think are interesting and, and uh, kind of uh, keys that we can we can use as we as we go on to look at the topic of this this conversation. First of all, he said that R has taken by storm disciplines ranging from science to economics, and that uh, in fact, when as he looks to the future of paleontology, he imagines a new wave of paleontologists armed not with a pick and shovel, but with a CT scanner and R code, which I think is a nice a nice image to have. Um, there's some more general comments too that I, I think are, are relevant and, and well, well, well observed. First of all, he notes that uh, in paleontology that the data has increased by perhaps an order of magnitude from what was possible 10 to 15 years ago. And furthermore, that the combination of open access data and open source analytical tools means that both of the two studies he's talking about reach a high standard for replicability. So I think both of these comments are, are very apropos and could, I, I assert, be made for a very, very large number of other disciplines in science these days. And in fact, that, that is behind what will be a theme for what I'm going to say today, which is that 
the R software and, the, and, <clears throat> and uh, its applications are actually designed for research in data science and for serious applications uh, of, of that. Furthermore, this is not just something that's new, it's part of the history of R. As we look at, at how R came to be and, and what happened before R, uh, this, this design, this connection with what I'm gonna call data science was there from really from the beginning. The, the key features that this implies for R were also there from the beginning, but these features evolved and we didn't really recognize that they were there until after the fact. Um, so the, the way we're gonna uh, look at things today is in four steps. <clears throat> uh, first of all, we'll look at uh, what I will call data science as it took place at Bell Labs in the period over the decade before the actual uh, S began. Then at the S software that we uh, that we created at Bell Labs and what happened with it over basically the last quarter of the 20th century. Then of course R itself, uh, how it how it came to be and what's how it's evolved since its beginning, and then to go back and reflect a little bit on what uh, this the theme on uh, the theme that that R is designed for data science and what are the implications of that for R and, and for data science in general. So of course, if I'm gonna do this, I first need to say what I mean by data science. This is certainly a term that no one can avoid hearing these days. And like, uh, like most um, hot terms, it means different things to different people. Um, I'm gonna use it and I always do use it in a very specific and fairly simple way, which is that for me, data science is all scientifically valid studies <clears throat> where data is important, where the obtaining, organizing, uh, and making use of, of data is a key part of, of the scientific enterprise. Uh, that's not always the way people use, use the term, but it's what I will mean whenever I use data science today. When you define it this way, one of the things that we observe and, and that was mentioned in the, in the paleontology uh, perspective is that uh, the changes that have taken place in, the, in recent decades in the sources of data, in the organization of data, in the size of data, and in the computing that we have available to deal with the data uh, have made uh, nearly all of data science, nearly all of science into what I would call data science now. And so as we look at the, how science is going to evolve in the future, it's essentially a, a critical part of it is how to deal with data. And this is what everyone I think nowadays is, is recognizing. Having said that, uh, I also assert that although the term data science didn't probably exist until the late 1990s, uh, the data science as, as a fact, as, a, as an activity goes much further back. And in particular, if I look back at what was going on in the place that I'm familiar with, Bell Labs, you can see instances of what legitimately can be called data science as far back as the early 1960s. So it's this, it's this combination of, uh, of evolution and uh, understanding where the evolution is coming from in a, in a scientific sense that's the background for what we want to look at today. So as I said, we, let's begin by looking at, at uh, what I call data science as it existed early, early on, and in particular in the period, the decade between 1965 and 1975, roughly. So Bell Labs uh, at, this, at this time uh, was a subsidiary, the, the research and development subsidiary of the then AT&T Corporation, which has to be distinguished from AT&T nowadays. At that time, AT&T had what was essentially a semi-monopoly on the communications industry in the United States. It was the largest corporation in the world at one time, and Bell Labs was its research and development arm. Uh, the Bell Labs headquarters are in Murray Hill, New Jersey, which is a small uh, community about an hour's travel time from New York City. Uh, this is roughly what Bell Labs looked like uh, probably today, certainly at the time I retired in 2005. This would have been a picture of what Bell Labs at Murray Hill looked like. 
but the the, organ, the establishment there, the, the building there began in the early 1940s, in the early days of the Second World War, as a much smaller building, of course. And this is roughly what it looked like in, in the 1940s. It's actually a building that was, was still there and is still there now, roughly in the, the center right of the, of the bigger picture that I showed you before. So this is where a lot of the famous things happen. This is where the transistor uh, communication theory and the first uh, techniques for digital, digitally encoding data were developed. And I, my personal view of things is that the period beginning uh, with the establishment of Murray Hill in the early 1940s and going on for roughly 40 years from there until the, say the mid 1980s would be what I would call the, the golden years of, of, of Bell Labs research. This is when research at Bell Labs was really a very special thing. It was something that uh, has, is often cited uh, nowadays as um, kind of a, a way to, to make good things happen. And, uh, a book on the subject is called The Idea Factory. And uh, so my, my uh, time at Bell Labs began in, the summer of 1964 as a, as a summer intern. And at that time, Bell Labs looked more or less like this. So it's expanded from its, its beginning, not only as it's expanded in buildings, but it's expanded in the areas in which research and, and applications were being pursued. In particular, there was at this time and continued to be for many years, a statistics and data analysis research department that at Bell Labs, and that was the department I joined as, as a summer student initially and, and stayed on for most of the next 40 years and was head of for a number of years. So that's, that's where the, all of this took place. But so what, what was going on around then? And I think in order to understand uh, what, what was happening in, in the field that now we would call data science uh, at this time, it's good to, to take a look at computers and how computing had evolved uh, up to that time. In particular, let's step back another 10 years to 1955 and take a look at what would have been a typical computer, basically the state of the art in 1955. And this is it. <clears throat> this is an IBM 650. And I don't know how it seems to you, but I think to many of us, certainly in, in my generation, it kind of looks like something you might have played around with in your basement if you were trying to build hi-fi equipment or something like that in those days. You'll see things like resistors and wires and all that kind of good stuff. It sure doesn't look very much like a computer in the sense that, that we know one. And there's a good deal of truth to that. This was probably from the last generation of pre-transistor computers. Uh, all of the components in there are good old fashioned electronics. So as you might imagine, what that means is that its capacity to do computations and in particular to store much data were pretty primitive. And in fact, uh, over much of this period from 1955 to 1965, a good deal of the programming that was going on for that computer was also pretty primitive uh, to begin with certainly in 1955 and, and for a good deal of time after that the, uh, the computer facilities in terms of programming languages were very primitive. You basically uh, programmed this little guy one time and you programmed in assembly language. So, but a lot was going on in that, that decade. That was a very big decade for the evolution of computing. And if we take a look uh, at a computer from 10 years later, from 1965, it's quite different. It may still look kind of junky uh, or kludgy to modern ears, it still has punched card readers and things like that. But the computer has changed very much. The, the computations now are being done by transistors. They're much faster and much bigger. And in particular, important for our perspective is the capacity to deal with data has increased by an enormous amount. In the background here, if I count right, there are 10 uh, magnetic tape readers, magnetic tape decks. And so although that's still not a large amount of data by our modern standards, it was enormous in comparison to what was available a decade earlier. Furthermore, the software has changed. Uh, there's been a great deal of activity in numerical analysis and in various uh, areas of research over the decade in between, which has resulted in a large number of uh, 
new methods being developed specifically for automatic computation. So the, the result of all that is that it, at least at a, a few locations, there was serious science going on using substantial amount of data. You know, say for example, a whole reel of, of magnetic tape. Uh, and in, computations on that scale already demanded quality software to get, to get the good results, to get the results you needed in a reasonable amount of time and emphatically and above all to get accurate, uh, believable results. So there's a lot, a lot of activity going on in, in, in that period. Uh, and the, the result was that there were collections of, of algorithms as they, as they were called then that were essential for data science for the research and applications, for example, that were going on at Bell Labs. It was essential to use the best algorithms available to get the best results. And that's still true, obviously. Um, uh, that's become more and more critical as the years have gone by, but it will be an essential part of the story that we're gonna tell here. So what happened at uh, <coughs> Bell Labs was that we were developing over this decade an extensive library of what would be called algorithms in those days, uh, which were the support for the, the research and the applications of of data science that we were that we were involved in, uh, and that, that includes some research that was going on at Bell Labs. But it also included things we picked up from uh, many many sources around the globe. In fact, that was basically what I was doing for the for the first decade of my research career at Bell Labs. So as a result of, of all of this, one of the things that came to my mind was that it might be nice to collect what was known about uh, algorithms for data analysis, as we would call it at that time, uh, and have a book. And <laughs> this was not greeted with enthusiasm, actually, by the publishers at that day. The, the idea that, that someone would buy a book on methods for computing with data was just not quite acceptable. But after a certain amount of effort, I did manage to convince Wiley to publish the book. And so it came out. And this is it, Computational Methods for Data Analysis. The reason I'm bringing this up in today's talk is that we can get a good feeling for what was going on in computing for data science at this time by looking at <clears throat> the chapter headings for this book. Because what I was doing here was describing to people what was available, where they could find it, and what they should use in, in doing data analysis. So the chapter headings, uh, actually, if we look at them, reveal that there were a number of important areas that were going on. Linear models, for example, uh, means using what were relatively new but important algorithms in uh, matrix algebra and matrix decompositions, things like that. Nonlinear models required uh, good software for optimization and nonlinear least squares. Simulating random processes required good algorithms for generating uh, Monte Carlo data, data from spe specified uh, statistical distributions. In computational graphics, we actually had a, a package <coughs> of Fortran and subroutines. Everything was a Fortran subroutine you know, <laughs> for us in those days. We had a package of, of, of Fortran subroutines for doing graphics, which in fact, introduced a structure for graphics, which is pretty much what you'll see in the base graphics in R today. So there was lots of stuff going on and it was, these were important things. So what was missing? Well, what, so what, how did you use these things? This was really the, the, the question that became critical for some of us at this point. You used these things certainly at Bell Labs by developing what were known as computer runs. This was, <clears throat> everything was Fortran, as I said, and you managed to use the software by writing a Fortran main program, which put, collected things, uh, got, made sure you had the data you needed and invoked all of the computations, specific computations that were required for what you wanted to do. That was the way it was done. But the, the fact of the matter was that even in the best of circumstances, this, in, put in a delay of minutes or more likely hours between having an idea and being able to try it out. And when Rick Becker joined Bell Labs uh, in 1975, he and I got to thinking that this was just really not, not the way should, things should happen. Uh, at this point, time shared computing uh, was generally available, becoming available, and even personal workstations were pretty much on the, on the horizon. 
So we felt that there was a potential for much better interaction between the data scientists and what they wanted to do than you could do with the conventional techniques. So that was, that was our idea. And that was what sparked our, our interest in, uh, in what would eventually become S. Basically, we said, let's consider that we're, we're doing serious data analysis. Can we make that interactive? Can, can we provide people with an environment in which they, they can get ideas, try out ideas, and get results quickly? But it's important to remember that this was always within this context. The goal here was to explore data interactively and have new ideas, but it was always a constraint that we needed to, to use the very best computations available. So it was this, this tension between uh, trying to explore things interactively, but always being sure that you were doing, doing valid data science that, that, that uh, was really at the, at the fundamental of, of, our, of, our, um, of our thoughts when we were trying to design S. So this is one of these cases where the idea was there from very early on, but it was a long time before we kind of got around to actually stating it in, in a clear term. In fact, the, the first, uh, general purpose and, and, uh, and kind of uh, zingy version of that that I know of was in, in my 2008 paper, Software for Data Analysis. And in that, in that, uh, in that book, I borrowed uh, from Gene Roddenberry uh, some terminology that was used in the Star Trek series of, of television programs. And that was to contrast or to, to put together the mission, what we're trying to do, the goal of, of our activities and the prime directive, uh, what, what, what is the, the uh, unbreakable law that you, can't, that you must obey as you do this. So, so of course the mission of uh, Star Trek was to boldly go where no one had gone before. And uh, I said that our mission was to explore ideas for data science, to boldly go into new directions and try out new ideas in data science. But the prime directive was essentially to do no harm and, and to produce trustworthy software when you do this. So, so this was the design that, that lay behind our initial work on S. And I claim that it, this is still <clears throat> fundamental to, to the way that, that, that our works and the way that we want to work with data science. So that was what started our work on the S software. And uh, S began as un, un, somewhat unusually for this kind of thing. S has a very identifiable start date. It is May 5th of 1976. So a little over 45 years ago, because on that date, uh, Rick and I got a few of our colleagues at, at Bell Labs together and presented to them the ideas that, that he and I had been working on for an interactive environment for doing data analysis. And as it happens, the, uh, the very high quality uh, computer graphics that were used in, in my presentation at that talk have survived. And here's one, this is the first, the first, um, the first view graph, we didn't have slides in those days, the first view graph that I showed on these days. And somewhat unusually, I actually remember to put the date on, this was uh, what you were supposed to do in labs at, at that time, but I usually didn't remember. So this funny looking diagram is, is, is kind of key to uh, this, the philosophy that was going to go into S and, and continues. Um, but remember everything was 4chan these days. So what we're seeing in this diagram, there's actually two parts to it. There's the top part and the bottom part. The top part uh, is what we were terming as being an interface to an algorithm. So remember we had this large, uh, <clears throat> this large and, and growing library of Fortran subroutines, and we wanted to be able to have interactive access to those. So our, pr our scheme for doing that was to design another Fortran subroutine, which we called an interface subroutine. And this would be what would be called <clears throat> in response to the user's interactive input. So I suggest you think of this as an R function, of course, in Fortran. And, and what it did was it, it got a, a, a single argument which dis, uh, encoded, described what the interactive user had supplied as arguments to this function. And it then did some computations, probably called one or more of the routines on our library and returned a Fortran structure which represented the output from, from that function. So that was basically how, how we proposed to organize things. And the 
the bottom part of the, of the diagram is the data structure that we were going to use to do this. And we don't need to worry too much about the details about it, except to note that what it is conceptually is two, two structures in which um, vectors of numbers and other things and, and other kinds of objects are encoded in Fortran and are uh, given optional names that are available to the interface routine. So again, think of, uh, think of an R object. Uh, obviously everything is, as I say, is Fortran, but that was basically the design. And that was what we ended up implementing as, as S. Over the next couple of years, uh, S was uh, actively worked on by our, by our group. And it was used in, in Bell Labs and more generally by some of the de uh, development areas at, at at and By the end of 1978, we had a, a pretty reasonable version of it. In the, the next few years, we, uh, we rewrote the, the software to uh, operate on top of the Unix operating system. This was a new operating system being designed. Very conveniently, it was being designed by our colleagues in computer science on the floor above us at, at Murray Hill. So when Unix was uh, made available uh, for a number of, of computer systems uh, on a license basis by at and we managed to do the same thing for S. So S became available in, in the licensed form. More importantly though, for the, for the story we're telling is that over this next period, uh, S was redesigned almost from completely from the bottom up. Uh, in a, Pursuing the same goals uh, as, as we pursued before, but in, a, in an entirely new form and a new organization and with some, some new principles and concepts that, that were involved. In particular, uh, the new version emphasized programming in the S language. Uh, there was now an, uh, an S language with a lot of functional programming facilities and people were encouraged in, uh, to program in it. Furthermore, the... <coughs> uh, the objects that we, we saw uh, were, no, no, were no longer Fortran objects. Now they were S objects and people were encouraged to think of them in, ter in, a, in terms that were specific to the S language itself. So really, again, what, what we have here are the two, fundament two of the fundamental concepts that have been part of S and subsequently part of R from, from then on and are, in my view anyway, key to understanding how the system works and, and how best to use it. Uh, and again, as, as with the previous case, it took us a long time to actually make this explicit and, and get a, a very clear, precise statement of it. But, but from the historical point of view, the important thing is that the ideas were there early on. And in this case, uh, a really specific and, and plain language description of, of what's going on didn't occur, I, I don't think, until in, in its full form, until my 2016 book, Extending R. And there I introduced uh, three principles right, that I called the <clears throat> object function and interface principles. And in fact, uh, I would say that the majority of that book is involved in exploring those principles and their consequences for computing for data science. Uh, the object principle, is that everything that exists in R is an object. The function principle is that everything that happens is a function call. And those are, are uh, in, important for understanding R. We won't, I won't talk about them today, but, but basically that whole book is, is involved in exploring that. And the third principle is the one that we've already uh, come across and was then enunciated specifically, namely that interfaces to other language are part of R now, no longer just to Fortran, to many, uh, to essentially any other source of, of good software. So that was that was uh, that was the, the version of S that went out. It was <clears throat> much more widely used than. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me say one more thing. Uh, so as I say, although although the the in in the um, in the book I'm talking about are in fact. As I've, as I've argued, uh, these principles apply to the, to the version of S that we're, we're talking about at this point as well. 
And in particular, uh, <coughs> I went back recently and took a look in a very early object, uh, which hardly anybody has ever seen, which was a, uh, a book length description of S that uh, was produced within AT&T early on in, in the evolution of S. Uh, and in that book, there's this, the statement that fundamental to the philosophy of S is the uniformity of expressions and data, which in, in a vague way is essentially the, 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 two, the two first principles. And this is back in 1981. Anyway, that, that, that was where we were. Uh, and as I say, the, uh, this version of S uh, became much more widely used uh, and in, it uh, was then described in two books uh, that came out. The first book was called The New S Language uh, by Rick, Rick and I and our colleague Alan Wilkes. This was a description of how to program in S and uh, to some extent how, how S itself worked, uh, the mechanics of the language. Um, and the second book was uh, Statistical Models in S, which was a, a product of about 10 authors, uh, which was edited by, by me and, and Trevor Hasty. And this described uh, some new extensions to, to the language and also uh, software for a, a variety of statistical models, introducing a, a new approach to, to dealing with, with models and, and data. So these two books are important, not only because they were <clears throat> quite widely used by, by the people using it as, but also because they provided essentially an open uh, public public description of, of the language and how and how it worked. And they came to be called the blue book and, and the white book from the colors of the of the covers. And they will be very relevant when we come to talk about R. So that was basically where things things were. And over the next uh, number of years, basically the through, through the, the rest of the 20th century, <clears throat> the, the growth in the use of S and in the software that was developed by users to extend this uh, was considerable, was large. Uh, and this was an important part of, uh, I, I think, the, the evolution of th thinking about computing with, with data, about data science at that, at, at, uh, during this time. The next, uh, specific event of considerable importance was the appearance in 1996 in the Journal of uh, Computational and Graphical Statistics of a paper called R, a language for data analysis and graphics written by Rossi Haka and Robert Gentleman. And as Ross said on a number of occasions, uh, the, the R language was not unlike S. Meanwhile, uh, there was still work going on at, at Bell Labs in, in further extensions to S. And uh, in 1998, one more version of S came out and another book describing it. And this introduced some, some other new ideas, but it was backward compatible with uh, the, the version of S that was described in the blue book and the white book. And then in, in 1998 also, the the Association for Computing Machinery awarded S its Software System Award. And the citation says that S had for effectively, it says that S had for, forever altered the way people did data science. So that was good. And that was uh, much was going on in S in, in, a, in terms of uh, wide, widespread use, contributions of S software from the people involved in, in research in, in data statistics and data analysis, um, and, and even some commercial, commercial exploitation of it. But basically, by the end of the 20th century, uh, R had, had arrived, and the, the story of what is going on in this, in this line now becomes the story of R. So after the publication of the paper by, by Haken and Gentleman, there was considerable interest in, in R. And over the next couple of years, a group that came to call themselves r Corps, a group of volunteers, as, as Rossi Haka describes them, um, who were very international and people interested in, in this prospect of having free open source software uh, in, in, in the spirit of, of, the, of what's been described, what they've seen described in the books on S. 
So this, uh, the, the R core group took over and still has uh, basically control over, over the R software. And um, in the period in, 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 from 1998 on when uh, implementation of R was going on, the important decision that, that the R core group made was that uh, R would replicate most of, of what was known about S. So R would, <clears throat> in effect, and as it was originally described, become a free S, an open source version of S. What this meant was that uh, the implementation of R would replicate most of what was in, in the blue book as a description of, uh, of how the language worked. And <clears throat> would implement from the white book a number of the specific uh, types of models, you know, linear models and various other kinds of models uh, that were described in the white book, and also the features of, of the language that were described in that book. Um, so this meant that uh, there was quite a lot of, of effort at this time in, in getting the details right and in, in re replicating what was what was going on, and so that people could then transfer their their computations from S to to R. All of this uh, went on and, and resulted on February 29th of the year 2000, uh, the release of version one 1.0 of the R software. So uh, at that time, of course, R was being distributed on the web, even in 20 years ago. But <laughs> there, uh, there were also a small run of specialized computer uh, compact disks were produced, uh, a strictly limited edition of, of which I was very gr gratified to get number one. And here it is. And it's, it's the contents of version 1.0 of R, uh, autographed by the, as I count them, 13 members of the R core group at this time. So this, this was it, this was R. And uh, I, uh, although of course I wasn't involved at this time because it was caref carefully done to, to not impinge on, on, on the, uh, the proprietary software in S. Uh, frankly, uh, we at Bell Labs were, were very happy to see this happen. And, uh, and from this point on, I think, uh, basically, the story of, of what's going on is the story of R. So uh, version one came out in, in February 2000, and uh, interest in R grew not entirely uh, uh, without a few hiccups because people were not quite sure that, that they were prepared to trust open source software. But, but certainly by the time that a few years went by, uh, it was clear that R was going to be the preferred uh, a preferred uh, vehicle for uh, for doing some, for doing research and serious applications of, of science with data. So as R developed, uh, it developed characteristics of its own, which were important extensions to what, what they were taking over from S. And in my opinion, the most important of, of the, the additional concepts that R introduced was the R package. Uh, uh, the, the last version of, of S had the concept of a chapter, which was somewhat the idea of an R package, but uh, the, the packages in R were important because they introduced new structure, uh, specific, specific structure on, on the way that you would organize the code and a number of utilities for installing, testing, running, uh, and, and uh, getting documentation from, from R. The, the, the key point in the philosophy of this, and something which I think distinguishes R from a number of other modern programming languages, is that this was effectively user-oriented. Uh, the package structure in R is strongly encouraging to people to document your code, make sure that your users can get good documentation in line. Uh, also, if you can, provide, provide tests for your code, provide test routines for the code. Furthermore, the R package structure <clears throat> makes it very easy to include essentially arbitrary other, other material in the R package. And in, in particular, and most importantly, it makes it easy to include interface software that allows you to invoke other, other, um, other languages from R, be it, be it Fortran, which is still around, be it C++, be it uh, Python, Java, JavaScript, whatever. And that's a very important part, as I keep saying, and very much believe in. 
Uh, in particular, the uh, repository called CRAN uh, was established by the by the, the, uh, the by our car by the people that were running R itself, and that's become the central uh, place where you go first to look for software on on anything nowadays. Uh, it's grown enormously exponentially over the, the period since it was first established. And it's and again, it's important because it's user oriented. It, it, this is where users can look uh, and, and get help in finding information about what's available, uh, some guides to uh, to various application areas, viewpoints of, of, of what, what software you, you should use, <clears throat> some indications of what's on, on the CRAN repository and all sorts of other tools uh, that help that help people make use of, of our software. And I think this is in fact, perhaps the, the most important aspect of, of why, why R has been successful over such a wide range of scientific applications. A number of groups have developed uh, that, uh, that are making use of R, that are extending what, what R can do. Um, the R Foundation is the, uh, the organization that actually officially and in a legal sense owns the, the, R, the R software and provides facilities that, that, that make, uh, that make the, the growth and the continued existence of, of R um, possible. There are many other uh, applications, like R OpenSci, for example, and uh, Bioconductor, which is a, uh, and, and many, many other communities. And again, the, the important point about this is that uh, the open source philosophy, open, open access data and open, open, open source software uh, are stimulating and facilitating all of these uh, valuable uh, enterprises which make use of, of, uh, of R as, as part, of, uh, part of their approach. But having said that, I think it's worth commenting that uh, this is not entirely only uh, in the non-commercial world. I think one of the things that's changed greatly, certainly since, since we worked on S, is that <clears throat> there's a growing recognition in the commercial world, in the, in the, in the world of, of uh, industry and other organizations that are using, they're using software for, for their purposes, that uh, open source software is not, is not the enemy, that there's a, a great value in cooperation amongst uh, intelligently managed commercial enterprises and, uh, and open source software. And it's certainly one example of that in the R world is, is the R Studio Corporation, which has taken over a lot of the, uh, the frontier work and a lot of the uh, interactions between the user community and R. And in my opinion, has done lots of good stuff. And the R Consortium, which is a, a collection of uh, corporations which exists to provide financial support and, and uh, guidance for, for the R enterprise. So that's basically where we are. Let's now take a look at what this all means. What, what do I think are the, the important aspects of, of data science using R? Well, as, as, as I said already, I think the, the key thing that you, you can see if you look at the, the um, universe of our, of our software is the enormous number, tens of thousands of packages that have been developed uh, on absolutely everything that you can imagine. And certainly uh, I have to say a number of things that I couldn't have imagined as being applications of R, including of course, and most importantly, a wide variety of scientific enterprises that make use of the R software. And it's important to note that the great majority of these are being written and distributed by the scientists, by the teams that are doing the actual science. I think this is key to, to what's going on. It's key to the value of R to the, to the scientific community and to what's likely to be happening in the future. And in particular, one of the things that, that might not be quite so obvious is that, as we saw at the very beginning, uh, people in paleontology and ecology and uh, environmental sciences and molecular biology and on and on, and, and whatever scientific application uh, discipline you can think of, tend to often be using R. And this means that there is uh, actually a lingua franca uh, amongst these scientific disciplines that 
will be, I claim, and is already a, a, a spur and an incentive and, and, a, and, a, and a help to interdisciplinary efforts in, in these sciences. In terms of um, making use of R, my, my personal uh, opinion is and remains that the three principles underlying R are still central to, to being able to, to, do, to write good software, to write good, reliable software based on R. Um, and I, I will send you to, to my 2016 book for very, very detailed discussion of, of all of that. But in particular, I think it, uh, what I would say is that in the modern world, of those three principles, it's the interface principle, which is especially important and one that, that one should never lose track of. Um, one of my prime philosophical statements these days when I'm talking about software for data science is that there's an awful lot of good software out there. And it's being written in, in a lot of different languages in Python, C++, and many other languages. And, and the, wise, the wise approach to it is to make use of whatever is good out there. And that's what R and R making, uh, R with its interfaces to other software is designed exactly to do that. So that's kind of where, where, where we are. Uh, to, to, to finish, um, let me say a little bit about what I see for the future. Not of course uh, going to be a totally happy or optimistic perspective. I think it's no, no secret to any of us that uh, the future the, for the next few decades has some enormous challenges and, and lots of bad things that are going on in the world. Uh, and so we could ask, what do we have to offer that might help in the future? The first thing to say, I think in, in this context is to just, disabuse people of the notion that somehow science is going to provide a magic solution to all of our problems. Um, as somebody whose current life is very much devoted to trying to build data science for the future, uh, the first thing that one has to say is that there's no magic bullet, that the future is not going to be saved by, by science. The future has to be saved by a commitment from, from us, from the communities worldwide that, uh, that are responsible for the problem. That's the key. And until that happens, uh, nothing else is going to do. Having said that, uh, the next thing to, to say is that if that commitment comes, uh, given that commitment, it's going to be absolutely critical to, to have science enlisted in understanding what the problems are, uh, what the possible reactions and solutions and, and activities are, are going to be. And that, that's going to rely absolutely on, uh, on data and sense of science. And it's got to be a new kind of science. It's got to be a, a science that's based on dealing on very large scale with problems, both large scale in terms of just data uh, and large scale in terms of its breadth of disciplinary uh, activities. It's going to be involving essentially all of the relevant areas of science and it's got to be dealing with problems on a global scale and driven by the goals that are uh, that are implicit in, in the problems that, that we're facing. So that's that's my view of the future and in my, my my waning years what I hope to do is just contribute a little bit to to providing the, the, the science that's that's necessary for that and in that, I'm hopeful, actually, and certainly uh, anxious to see that the R community is going to provide support for that, that kind of science. I think that the design of, of R uh, is, is what it should be for, for, that, for that role. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's what will happen. So thank you for, thank you for your attention. Uh, there is a printed version of uh, the his from the history of programming languages uh, of a paper on a related related paper uh, which uh, will will be um, uh, is is available it's it's open access so I encourage anybody who looks wants to look in the details to look on that so thank you and good day
Hi, everyone. This is Rick Peterson again. Um, we're going to stay on. We're gonna, we set some, uh, some time aside for a, a Q&A session. So if you have anything you'd like to ask Dr. Chambers, uh, please submit that to the Q&A feature. I know she's monitoring that. Usha, you're still on mute, by the way. Excuse me. Sorry? It's okay. okay. We can hear you now. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, Jesse Conchola asked, who first coined the term data science? Uh, yes, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer, although uh, one of my colleagues at, at Bell Labs, Bill Cleveland, uh, has occasionally claimed, uh, claimed that he invented it. Uh, I, start, I started seeing it in the late 1990s. And uh, of course, nowadays, it's a very widely used term. Um, and it, uh, I'll just, without getting us into that quagmire, I'll just say that, that sometimes it's used uh, as it is in a, in a recently published book to be equivalent to looking for patterns in data. Um, and that's fine, but uh, I always use it in the sense that I, that I describe where it's gotta be real science. Um, the, what are the origins of the, the, the names S and R? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good qu question too. Um, when we first uh, started work on it, it didn't have a name. It, it, it lived for about three months or so as the system. Uh, but as it became clear that we were actually going to have users, uh, we realized that it couldn't continue to be the system. So we asked our colleagues at, at Bell Labs to suggest some names and they did. Uh, Rick and I looked them all over and didn't like any of them, but we noticed two things. One was that all of them had the letter S in the name somewhere. And furthermore, as I mentioned, on the floor above us, there were the, uh, the Unix guys and Dennis Ritchie in, in that group had uh, written a programming language whose name was the single letter C. So we decided to use the single letter S. Um, now, as for R, of course, I can't actually say why R was chosen, although the fact that it was not unlike S may have something to do with it. You also might notice that the, the two authors of the 1996 paper, their first names were Ross and Robert. So, you know, who knows? The, yeah, uh, there were other systems, SAS, SPSS, IMSL, BMT. Yes, yes. Uh, that's a very, again, a very good question. Uh, there were, so when we came to think about doing, uh, doing an interactive environment, uh, there were in fact two different kinds of things out there that were both relevant for us to think about. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, the, the things like SAS and so forth, the, the statistical packages or statistical systems as they tended to be called, that was one thing. The other was that there were some interactive, uh, interactive languages and, and uh, programs that were, so some of which actually had some applications for statistics. So why didn't we use either of those? Uh, basically, uh, in fact, uh, the, 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 the mission and, and, um, and <laughs> the prime directive are really relevant here. Uh, SAS and SPSS and so on, at that time at least, lacked two things. First of all, they, they were semi, becoming to be semi-interactive, but primarily were not. They were primarily, you ran a job for BMD, for example, you, you ran a, a control card job to, to run a BMD thing. They were not really interactive. More importantly, they, they, they did what they did and that was it. You got what you got and that was not going to work for us. We had to have the ability to make use of, uh, of other kinds of software. Uh, so, and although you didn't ask it, the question was, why didn't we pick up on, on one of the existing interactive systems? In particular, there was a language called APL at that time, uh, which uh, Iverson at, at IBM had designed, which was an interactive language and quite an interesting, if weird, language. Again, the problem was, uh, the problem was that we had to have access to all of those good algorithms, the prime directives. Uh, and so although we, we considered uh, actually making use of APL, that was the main reason that we didn't go that way. Okay, uh, yes, so the 1996 paper uh, introducing R. Well, uh, I, 
did, I did outline this before. Let me go a little bit more into it. Let me emphasize though that I was not involved with this. They were occasionally I would get uh, uh, a little inquiry, mostly I guess from Robert Gentleman, not from Ross. But but they but quite rightly they were they were being very careful not to trade on on S's uh, proprietary software. So. Uh, Everything I say then is just going to be what I've gathered. So don't, don't take this as being necessarily true. I think that initially uh, Ross, Ross in particular, wasn't necessarily aiming to produce a free version of S. He, he'd been much influenced or, or had been impressed by the good things in S, but thought there were some good, some other things that were not in S that he wanted to produce. So, it might have gone in several directions at this point, but it was gradually as the R core group got together uh, that they made this decision. And I, I would put down the, the date 1998, but you know, you don't necessarily believe me on that as the point at which they officially decided that they were going to replicate what was in, in the blue book and the white book. That gave them with a, a really, you got to understand that was a really challenging assumption to, to make. There was, uh, there's a lot of software, there's a lot of software in those versions of S, particularly when you include the statistical model software. And so what they were trying to do was produce software that was open source and that reproduced the results accurately for all of that. That was a really serious programming effort. And I'm, so I'm not, <laughs> it's not at all a surprise that it would, it would take you some time to do that. <laughs> Everything was Fortran, remember? Uh, sorry, the question was, how was the decision to index from one instead of from zero made? Everything was Fortran, remember? Fortran indexed from one. Uh, the, 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 I'm, not even, I'm not even gonna touch the arguments over which is right and which is wrong, but that, that's the historical reason for it. What were the biggest challenges in putting together the S language? That's a good question. Um, well, I guess, I guess again, it, it was it was trying to combine the mission and the prime directive. Uh, we wanted. We wanted something that people could use interactively to do serious research and data analysis and fairly serious applications uh, uh, to, to real data. And at the same time, we wanted to make sure that this was something that could do valid, reasonably large scale, accurate computations. Uh, so we spent quite a lot of time really um, uh, looking for uh, how to do this right and deciding on uh, what, what were the details of, of the language and so on. And, and of course, <laughs> the other small detail was that the, the, computer, the programming team was Rick and me and, and, some, and some people that, that were helping us. So. Uh, is there an intrinsic advantage of R over Julia for data science in addition to the huge R user database? Uh, these are good questions. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know whether I'm supposed to be reading the names. Apologies if I'm not reading your name and I should be. Uh, that was from Eugene Gallagher. Okay, Julia. Um, so for those who don't know, Julia is a relatively recent programming language, which uh, is uh, has a style, I mean, it's, it's, it's different. It's not directly related to R, but you could say in a sense that it's got a lot of the same design facilities for R. It has a, a, a class and, and object-oriented system that's very similar. It's a functional language and so forth. Its claim to fame is that, <clears throat> that it, it produces uh, software that's quite efficient, that's really rapid. Um, well, no, I, I don't think that's the question that I would want to talk about. The question I would, I would say is that you're much better off making use of Julia for things where Julia has good software to do it and using R for things where R has good software to do it. And of course, of course, R has an interface to Julia. Uh, there's one described in my book, but there's a, a better one that, that exists now. So I, I think I would just go back to my statement that people should use the software that works best. 
Um, Julian's had a slightly slow, slow start just to make an editorial comment, which is mostly because it, it wasn't coming up with a killer app. I think maybe it's getting close to having some killer apps right now. So I, I like Julia, um, but it's not going to replace R. Oh, John, sorry to interrupt, but there's been a number of questions about S plus. Like, how did that fit into the history of R and S? Good, good. good. Yeah, th thanks, Sasha. Yeah, S plus. So after S was licensed by at and uh, the predominant licensees were university departments and other people doing research. And they got a not-for-profit license, which basically let them do their own thing, and, uh, but, not, but not do anything for profit. It was also possible, however, to get a commercial license from at and for software that, that built on S. And there were, in fact, <coughs> fair number of those, I'd guess maybe five or so uh, companies that started up and produced software that was based on, on S, but was commercially available and, and had various facilities that were added to it. Over a period of few years, S plus uh, became the one of those that was most widely used. And uh, eventually they actually, I think had an exclusive license. Um, when R came along, uh, for, for a fair amount of time, there were a reasonable number of, of um, organizations that didn't trust open source software and so continued to use S+. Basically though, I, and, and S+, uh, still, still exists. Uh, but I think in, in effect, uh, as, as open source software became more um, attractive, uh, R, I won't say, took over from S++, but, S++, but uh, became the, um, the, the, the main thing. A uh, question from Stan Alton. In, in your view of the future, do you see statistics as a discipline as evolving into a distributed science where our role becomes more of development? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but let, let me say that I think that right now, there's a very interesting dynamic going on in which and this is precisely what I'm personally interested in right now, uh, between communication between statistics, computer science and mathematics on the one hand and various scientific disciplines on the other. Uh, and that's, where, that's the part of data science that I'm particularly interested in. And I think is in, as I said at the end of my talk, is, is really very, very important for the, for the future, the future of, of all of science. Uh, Usha, you want to answer this question? Oh, you want me to answer this question? No, you know, I just Are thought there, you, no, 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 no. About the, any computational challenges to advancement of data science that you think can be addressed by R. I think I want you to answer that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, I, there was something appeared on the Q&A that, that was misleading me, my, my fault. Oh, no problem. Are there computational advantages to the advancement of data science that you think cannot be addressed by R? If so, oh, yes. Uh, again, uh, you know, like, I'm going to keep coming back. <laughs> the, the more you bounce me, the more I'm going to keep coming back to that. Interfaces are part of R. Uh, it was never, never, absolutely never our design that S should take over the whole of computing uh, for, for data analysis. It wasn't then, it isn't now. Uh, the thing that, that, that R provides is uh, a, a set of software, so I, the, the, you know, the ideas, the ideas about functions and objects, and I didn't go into them today, things about op, object oriented programming and stuff like that, which are excellent tools for building new software that, that does um, computations related to data, that does data science. As you go and, and start doing that, you will encounter uh, things you want to do, computational jobs you want to do that uh, R doesn't handle, that, that may, if you're lucky, are being handled well by some other software. Let me take, uh, as, as a particular example, the whole area of machine learning and uh, neural networks and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> that's an area that is not widely implemented in R and shouldn't be. Uh, there are a number of implementations in other languages, for example, Python, 
and what <clears throat> and the way that machine learning and those uh, things can be used effectively in R and are being used effectively in R is through an interface to the so to the software that, that does it. Um, and um, go go look up our studio. And our studio will tell you how to do that. Okay, next question. Some describe a data scientist, a person with substantive expertise, programming skills, and math stats knowledge. <laughs> well, <clears throat> a data scientist, I'm not sure I want to make it into an animal. But uh, as I say, I think that what data science is, is uh, the application of, of a set of ideas and techniques, often coming from statistics or computer science or both, uh, to problems in science that um, depend on dealing with data in a fundamental way. And, and as I said, and as, as that paper in paleontology also said, that's coming to be pretty much all of the serious problems that science faces. So I don't think of a data scientist as necessarily being a full-time person. I think it can be somebody whose main interest may be in statistics. Their main interest may be in paleontology. It may be in uh, other areas of science, but they are using the tools of data science and are learning as much as they need to learn about data science. So that, that, that it follows your, your description, but not necessarily as a, as a full-time job. Do you think, from David Keisler, do you think that the idea, an idea factor like the old Bell Labs is necessary for the kind of advances that are, are now taken for granted? Or is it just one way to get there? But another way, would you ever have developed S if you'd been working somewhere else? Ah, I love that question. Uh, at the time, um, 19, the mid 1970s, uh, one of the reasons that, that I was at Bell Labs, and one of the reasons I think that Rick Becker was at Bell Labs, was that there really, to be honest, was not an opportunity in academia to do and be rewarded for the kind of work that, that went into developing S. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion in, in various uh, places, various literature, about the idea factor. Incidentally, the idea factor is the name of a book by John Gertner that I recommend if you'd like to, to understand a little bit more about Bell Labs at that time. Um, could there be a new Bell Labs? Uh, various places like Microsoft and, and Google at times asserted that they're providing it. Uh, I think it was a unique period in, in history. Uh, I think it was a fascinating time. I consider myself enormously lucky to have been at Bell Labs during what I'm calling the golden years for, for Bell Labs research. But it depended on uh, both an attitude to research, which was unusual, perhaps unique, uh, and which encouraged the kind of research that, that, we, that, involved, that was involved in inventing transistors or Unix or S. Um, could that happen again now? It's hard to say. I do think though that the thinking about better environments for uh, for doing science and better environments for rewarding the people who are involved in science is going to be a critical issue for the future. I don't, I will be honest and say, I don't think that the reward system in academia or perhaps in industry either for scientific research is what it should be right now. And we'll see whether, whether that evolves. <sighs> what do you see as the greatest challenge for classically trained statisticians and their future in data science? Um, another great question. Uh, <clears throat> my answer there is very clear. I think that uh, there's wonderful stuff going on in, in, in statistics research and computer science research. I think that it's crucial for the people doing that research to understand more about how, how science works, about how actual science works, how about how you deal with data in a really challenging scientific enterprise and how you, how you do the analysis, how you, especially how you communicate the results. That's what data science to me has this, these three fundamental fundamental pieces. Uh, there's the data, um, obtaining, organizing, understanding, validating the data. There's the analysis, the modeling, whatever else. 
and there's the communication. There's the communication of the results of the analysis to your peers, to people in general public, to people in decision-making facilities. Data science, uh, to do it right, requires mastering all of those aspects. And I think that the challenge for statisticians and for others who would like to contribute to data science is to understand enough of how that works, how that really works in science. And that's what we're trying to do actually in the, in the data science scholars program at, at, uh, at Stanford is to bring people from all of these disciplines together and have them exchange ideas and, and work together. And I've got to say, I'm just tremendously encouraged by the progress this has made so far. And I'm hoping this will be a model generally. Could you give some perspectives on the evolution from the <laughs> S3 to the S4 object systems? <laughs> uh, this is getting a bit technical, uh, so I'll do it. I'll do it quickly. Um, but uh, but again, so <laughs> so what what's being talked about here? Uh, the the white book introduced uh, an approach to objects and classes, which are called S3 S3 classes. My 1998 book introduced a, a more formal and more general version of object-oriented programming. Um, naturally, I know I, I wrote them both, but naturally, since I wrote the S4 version later, I think it's better. But it does require more effort and more uh, more uh, computing, more more programming than S3. I think that the the, and the, the applications that are out there, if you want to see some serious S4 stuff, look at Bioconductor. The Bioconductor people use that. Um, our studio has, has gone a different direction, which I'm not gonna get into today. So I think they're both fine. I just think that if you really wanna get serious about designing uh, software, object-oriented software based on R, I would recommend using what I described in the Extending R book. Do you think we'll, next question. <clears throat> Do you think we'll see a lot of innovation coming out of the big tech companies? <laughs> Do you think statisticians are taking enough of a central role in the evolution of data science or computer scientists? Or do computer science and, and engineers have an advantage? <laughs> For example, the Python data analysis tools seem to be less influenced by statisticians. Um, <laughs> well, how does I how to answer this without getting somebody annoyed? Uh, um, I, I I know some of the people at, at Amazon and, and Google, particularly at Google, and I think there's uh, there's a lot of sincere effort to to do to do good stuff there. Um, personally, I, as as I indicated before, I think <clears throat> I think that the Bell Labs environment was a particular historical era, so things will be different. Uh, there's just a lot going on. And I, I would send you to various recent books on, um, for, for, for example, um, the title, Making Geniuses, I think, uh, is a, disc a discussion of some of the work that, that's gone in, in AI at these places. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I think, um, I think that the R version, the, the approach that R takes has uh, intrinsically great advantages. And if you look at the people in, who are doing the science, I think you'll see that R is, as, as that paleontology paper that we started with remarked, uh, R, he says, has taken by storm various things, various areas of science. I would hope that the, the future is what I've all, I, kept, I keep coming back to, a situation where people use the best software for whatever they're doing and they're able to interact with a variety of languages, including R. Finally, oh, hi, Blan. Uh, Blan Godfrey, an, an old acquaintance of mine. From one of your first customers that asked, do you think we can create a basic version of R for widespread use by people who are far from being data scientists? Um, for example, Blan says we're helping UNICEF create dashboards for the and to divide lower and middle income countries on turtle child care. Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I think um, it's not going to look really a lot like R, uh, but I think if you I think if you browse through, uh, uh, let me let me put in a plug here for um, 
an online facility called rseek. rseek.org is um, a tool for searching up uh, things from the literature and, and on the web that are related to R. And I think if you, if you do some literature, literature searches for um, e easy to use interfaces to R and things like that, you'll find that there are quite a few people who are, who are working with this. I do think that um, there's always going to be a distinction between the levels at which people approach data science and, and therefore that, um, that there is a place, there will always be a place for fairly high level languages like, like R. So good, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. Any further questions? We still have about 10 minutes for any other questions. Anyone wants to submit in the Q&A? Great questions, by the way. Thanks. I, I had a question, John. I, I was wondering um, when they, when Ross and Robert were interested in, you know, making the open source art, was there any like patent issues on S that they had to try to carefully tiptoe around or what was no, that like? Not patent issues. Um, okay. Patenting software is, is, is another whole game that, that Bell Labs was involved in. No, the, the issue that they had to make clear was, so there was this software that, that AT&T licensed for people to have. So people out there actually could get a copy of the S software, but of course they weren't supposed to make use of it. That was proprietary software. So the way you, you did uh, free software was what used to be called a clean room. You, you took public documentation and no software at all, and then tried to replicate what, what was there. And that's why the, the blue book and the white book were critical. They were public. And in the, in the blue book, in fact, there was a semantic description of the S language, which was quite useful for them. They had to work from that and, and not from anything else. So if they had, if they had stolen, you know, these guys were perfectly good guys. They were honest guys. If they had actually stolen some software from, from the S code, then they could have gotten sued by, by t and But no, that didn't happen. No, okay. And, and I, I love your Star Trek reference to boldly go where no one has gone before. And I, I think you truly have done that with the, with the S um, software back in the days, truly novel. You've truly done that. So you truly live up to that statement. Good. Well, um, thanks, everybody. Any other questions? We have we have some more time. Anyone else? I think there's one more QA. One more question. Ah, oh, yes. Can you describe the reward structure at Bell Labs and why that worked well? <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, very much to the point. Uh, the, so Bell Labs is a very hierarchical place. Uh, so for example, we were in the statistics and data analysis research department. And for a while I was the head of that department. And that was in a, a what's, what's called a center or a laboratory, depending where you were, uh, which was the mathematics and statistics center and so on. You went up uh, in hierarchical to the head of research and then eventually to the head of Bell Labs. And the reward system was, was actually kind of simple. What happened was that uh, once a year, everybody wrote up the wonderful things they had done. Uh, they, in fact, they were collo colloquially called the I am greats. And then uh, those of us, so, so when I was in, in management, the, the department heads would get together and review all of that and, and kind of in principle, although not in practice, uh, get an ordering of, of how, how valuable the contributions had been from all the members of the group. Then there was a process of uh, deciding how much of a raise everybody was gonna get. And in a very um, unprecise way, the, the ratings of how well you'd done affected what your raise was. But that, that was the reward system. And the important thing that, again, the idea factory issue that comes up was that, so what were you getting rewarded for? Well, you were getting rewarded basically for having good ideas. For, in principle, you were getting rewarded for things that would eventually make a profit for AT&T, but that was a very indirect kind of reward. The specific reward was you just done something really good. So it was good to be a hero. Uh, it was good to come up with something like Unix or frankly S that was clearly having a big impact out in the world. 
it was not a question of how many papers you wrote or what publications you, you'd had or in a sense, what theorems you'd proved, although it was good proving theorems too. This was a very flexible and when it was, when it was properly applied, I think a very effective reward system. It encouraged people to have ideas, to work on new ideas and to not be inhibited by restrictions on, of, you know, from other criteria. So to me, to me, that was the essence of the reward system. Uh, and of course it depended in part on AT&T having a virtual monopoly at that time. They could afford to do that. Yeah. Is it reproducible in the future? Who knows? Do you think the notion of interfacing between languages is a value represented beyond R and the broader data science community? Ah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's certainly much less emphasized um, and at, the <laughs> at the risk of uh, offending people, fortunately, who were probably not on the call, so it's all right. Um, it's not something that, that people come up with in computer science. I think in computer science, you're supposed to invent something that takes over the world, uh, whether it's a new language like, like Julia or machine learning or whatever. Um, and I think it's, it's again, something that comes out of this involvement with data science, because the people who are gonna appreciate, in my opinion, they're gonna appreciate the fact that they can use code from any language are likely to be the people who are doing the science because they don't wanna to have to replicate a Python, big pile of Python code in R or vice versa. Uh, so I just, uh, so the broader data science community, yes, but I think not maybe as much as I would like to see it uh, in, in fields like computer science and, and, and others. <laughs> These, are, these questions are getting touchier and touchier. Could I talk about my impressions about the tidyverse? It seems like a mutant version of R, almost a new language unto itself. Um, not too, I want to say too much about that. Um, it's a free, it's, it's, it's open source software, you know. Um, it's being actively promoted by our studio. Uh, though for those few in the audience who don't know what the tidyverse is, this is something that, that uh, the, our studio, in particular Hadley Wickham, uh, have devised. And it, it's, um, it, it's, well, uh, they wouldn't like me to say this. It's kind of a, sub, a, a subclass in the technical sense of data frames. And it's got lots of rules about how they work. Um, it seems to be very helpful for people. I'm a little worried about it, it narrowing people's view of what data is. So my only real objection to it is, is just, I hope it doesn't narrow people's ideas because you've got to have very flexible ideas to deal with modern data. <laughs> was Kreskel, <laughs> this is Joe Kreskel, uh, was Kreskel still active at Bell Labs when it were doing it? Yes, Joe, Joe Kreskel was another member of the mathematics, <clears throat> um, the mathematics and statistics research research environment. Uh, I knew Joe quite well. Um, the, the, my one my my one Joe Kreskel story that I have to tell you is that, as far as I know, he was the last person in the mathematics research center to have a cabinet in his office which contained punched paper cards. He maintained those long after I believe there was a card punch on in, on the Murray Hill facility. Uh, given R can use other systems, what are your thoughts on maintaining operability when systems change? Um, I ask if we have programs that need to work tomorrow as well as today. Um, well, of course, th that's a problem. So the problem here is, is you know, I, I write I write some code that makes use of something. Uh, and uh, and uh, somebody who owns something changes it. Of course, that's a problem which is universal. It's not simply when you use interfaces. That arises most often in the R world when somebody changes an R package to do something that's inconsistent. Um, in the long run, uh, you're, you're a sitting duck. Uh, there is no way to legally prevent people from doing things. But uh, it's not just the community, the community that's using interfaces to Python that's going to be up in arms. In fact, if you look at the history of Python, the famous Python 2 versus Python 3 uh, argument, 
is a very good example of people being unwilling to accept incompatible changes. I think if something is good, um, there's going to be enough emphasis, enough <clears throat> weight behind maintaining it, accessibility to it. Uh, but it's a problem. It's, a, it's going to be a problem. All right. I think um, we're really getting closing in on time. Um, but uh, maybe one last quick question. Otherwise, we'll have to end for today. But this has been great. It's been 27 questions. A lot of questions. So <laughs> I'm impressed. Good. Yes. I, I, I thank you all for your questions. I think these are great questions, and it's good to talk about them. You put through put John through a, a marathon session of questions, <laughs> and you nicely answered all of them. Thank you. This has been great. We really appreciate John Chambers opening as our first webinar speaker. It's been tremendous. We really thank him, and we thank all of you for attending. Um, you know, we'll try to make available maybe the video or slides after after this presentation. I know all of you enjoyed it, so we'll try to do that. Thank you, everybody, and we'll plan to have another webinar in the future.